It's a great pleasure now to welcome uh, John Dolan um, to the FEST 3 for Cargo and Commercial Ship Surveyors. This is the second presentation we've had from the Standard Club. And as I said to Akshat this morning, um, you know, we're very grateful to have input from the PNI clubs. I think it's very, very important that there's a dialogue between surveyors and PNI clubs in, in this kind of environment. So I got to meet John uh, back in about this time last year, actually, John, wasn't it? We were on board the QE2 at a conference. It was the 10th anniversary of the... That's correct, Mike. Yes, it was. Yeah, which was great fun. John and I shared a table there. Uh, John gave a presentation, not dissimilar to this, I know he's updated though, and I would say this is a very on-topic trend. So, uh, delighted, John, that you've agreed to come and speak, and uh, I should have called you Captain John, though, and of course, uh, my apologies for that. <laughs> and I'll now hand over to John. Okay, Michael, th thank you very much indeed, and can you hear me still? Loud and clear. Good, good. Well, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, guys, of, of technology, particularly when you're working from home. So apologies for the repeated sound checks and, and, and the reassurance. My name is John Dolan, indeed, as Mike said, and I'm the Deputy Director of Loss Prevention at the Standard P&I Club. Um, we, as an insurer of, of the, a very large proportion of the, the, of the international fleet, the, we, we insure about 10% um, of the world fleet. Um, we see, we see uh, incidents, accidents, fires, pollution incidents on a day-to-day -day basis. One of them, uh, one of those kind of trending challenges for the last few years has been container vessels and the issue of Mr. Clare cargoes. So that's why I'd like to concentrate on that particular topic today. So a, a little bit about myself before I, we start. Um, I'm a master mariner by background and I, I returned to university a few years, many years ago, for a couple of years uh, after being at sea. And uh, I ended up with, with a, a degree in uh, ship management and international shipping. I have spent most of my career since then in ship management and uh, ship operations prior to joining the Standard Club five years ago, where my job now is effectively recycling that experience back into the industry and into the marine, in, from the marine industry into the insurance industry with uh, briefing underwriters and uh, claims guys on a, on a daily basis. Also, in, in a previous life as a ship manager, I was also a board member of the International Chamber of Shipping for five years. So I'm very familiar with the, the negotiations and discussions and the debates that take place in that forum also. So this talk is about Mr. Cleared Cargos. And I want to give you a little bit of context about how it, we got here, some of the casualties that have been encountered along the way to this particular uh, point in time now. I'll talk to you a little bit about Mr. Clare Cargo's the why, the how, and the what. That goes to the core of the, the talk. And then just talk about the container industry working together, what initiatives are out there to try and address this uh, ongoing uh, major problem for the industry and for the insurers, and some of the initiatives that might be adopted to help address the challenges. And I'll talk a little bit about the slot ch charter agreements as well towards the very end and a very, very light touch way to, sh to show what role they play and what uh, initiatives they might uh, adopt to uh, improve the situation. So how we got here and this is why. Now, some of you might recognize that particular incident. It was uh, the KMTC Hong Kong at Lem Chibang last year. Uh, a very dramatic incident, very dramatic footage entered the, the you know, 
I suppose, the popular media, but uh, right across the board, it brought into sharp relief as if as if any further uh, relief was wasn't required uh, of what the what the challenges are in container shipping and what dangers lurk in the boxes on board vessels that very, very frequently go undetect undetected, mostly undetected, until a situation like that arises. Here are just two further examples of casualties that have had similar, and this is going back some way in history now, but you have the Hyundai Fortune in 2006 and the CMA Jakarta in 1999, the two major ca casualties, but um, again, illustrating the, the dangers associated with, with uh, misdeclared cargo and also illustrate well the damage that's done, the destruction that's wrought upon a vessel and the, the difficulties that the guys on board the vessel, the crew have on board the vessel when a situation like this arises. As, as a point, I, I sat in a conference uh, last year when a senior safety representative from one of the major container lines remarked, when we're talking about fire, he remarked that in reality, crew members on board can address maybe one fire, that's one box in one location fire. But when that becomes two, it gets very difficult. And when it becomes three and out of control, then it's almost abandoned ship time. So that's how serious the situation is when a fire breaks out on board. But they continue because in the text I'm reading now on the bottom of the slide, a significant fire occurs, it's estimated that a significant fire on board a container vessel on average every 30 days. And this is completely unacceptable. And already, according to the SINs data, and I'll remark further about SINs in the remainder of the, of the presentation, um, but 11 fires have been reported to SINs in 2020. So again, of this nearly, well, it's more than one a month because this is up to October on average. And the cost of the insurance uh, sector, based upon data supplied by the TT Club, is around $500 million per year. So the amounts at stake in these situations is enormous. And it doesn't stop on board the vessel because this is an image of Tianjin after they had an enormous explosion there a few years ago. Um, so this illustrates the point that it's not just on board a ship. The dangers are in the boxes. The boxes can be anywhere in the, in the supply chain. And in this case, you can see the magnitude of the destruction in Tianjin. Of course, this focused the authorities' minds in China to the problem. And in, to some degree, maybe to even a large degree, the situation is being addressed. But it still continues other parts of the world also. So misdeclared cargos remain a problem. For a, a little bit of context, just to put a perspective on this thing, I put this slide in to illustrate the, the evolution of the container vessel. And more particularly, I'm from the, the point C to E, C being, we'll say the post Panamax around six to 8,500 tons around the year 2000. And here we are 20 years later, just 20 years later, we have ship size now with the ultra large container vessel, uh, 22, 23,000 TEU, three times uh, increase in terms of the, the, the ship carrying capacity in that period. So the magnitude of the vessels is quite astonishing, quite astonishing. And when you have 22,000 boxes on board, from an insurer's perspective, from a ship manager's and a crew a master's perspective, the dangers are huge if something gets out of control, like an emergency arising from a fire. So that's just for, for context. And further background on this, we estimate, and I think this is a very, very rough estimate, we estimate that there are about 200 million TU containers uh, shipped every year, to about 200 million. And 
based upon data that we shared and obtained from the uh, TT Club, the reckon is that about 10% of that 200 million is dangerous goods. But, and here is the real concern for insurers and for safety managers and masters, around one third of that DG cargo is misdeclared. That is the belief now on board any ship at any one time. It may be zero or it may be a number of times that. We're not sure, but it's a very, very approximate figure. But in reality, that translates into potentially around six and a half million containers yearly or 18,000 containers daily are misdeclared. And that is, in a nutshell, the real concern because we know that it just takes one misdeclared cargo in the wrong place at the wrong time can spark a disaster on board a vessel with all the attendant challenges that that comes that comes with it so just to talk a little bit about misdeclared cargo and how it happens we frequently see cargoes such as calcium hypochlorite described as water treatment or bleaching powder or lime or other variations on the theme. Activated charcoal being described as water pipe tablets. Lithium ion batteries described as mobile phone accessories or electronic parts or something like that. And why do these misdeclarations take place? Well, it is to avoid, we believe, the IMDG restrictions on packaging and quantity. In other words, they are trying, the shippers are trying to avoid the hassle factor associated with the declarations of dangerous goods, and also to avoid the additional carrier for charges for carrying that dangerous goods. The surcharge, I think, is about $1,400 per box. But of course, that varies from, from shipper to shipper from time to time, but it's of that order of magnitude. So somebody is shipping dangerous goods to save a thousand bucks or a thousand or fourteen hundred dollars, which is utter insanity. And also, maybe some carriers would have a policy, a blanket policy of not permitting dangerous goods on board. So misdeclaration is the easy of, easiest way to get around that particular uh, restriction. And here's an example just taken from a report I received last, last month. This is just a very brief description of a fire uh, on a, in a box on a vessel from China to Singapore. The vessel departed uh, Sheiko, I think it was the port uh, bound for Singapore. Smoke was reported from the container located deep in the cargo hold deep, deep, buried deep in the stow. The, the crew reacted well. They released the CO2 and extinguished the fire. Now that's good fortune rather than real scale because in any fire, you do need luck on your side to, make, to be absolutely successful. But the box was discharged at Singapore when the vessel got there. But on lifting the container, the bottom fell out of it. And the, the, the fire continued to burn in the bottom of the cargo hold. And the cargo had been declared as manganese dioxide cells and shown in the bill of lading as electronic goods. But the packing list in the commercial invoice revealed lithium ion batteries. Now the challenges and the risks associated with, call, with, with carrying batteries, used batteries is well known right now. The, the exact uh, initiator or stimulus for this particular fire is still being investigated, but the, bat, the, the point was that that cargo should not have been uh, misdeclared and it should not have been stowed where it was deep in the hold. Just another example of the challenges that I'm describing right now. So I mentioned the SINs. Now SINs, and my apologies for, for explaining it so late as this, but it stands for the Cargo Incident Notification System and, it's, and, and, uh, and how it came about. This was a group that was established in 2011. It was an initiative of the major container uh, carriers at the time and was also joined by the, the international group of P&I clubs. 
It, so it was carriers and insurers were simply alarmed by what was happening and the frequency of these fires. So they got together to form this group. And the purpose of the group is to highlight the risks posed by certain cargoes and packing failures. So it really focuses in on the DG goods that are shipped on container vessels. But the primary purpose of the group is what it says, cargo incident notification system. It captures and analyzes information and makes recommendations relating to the carriage of dangerous goods. And so out of that forum comes a publication or came a publication 18 months ago, two years ago now, on the guidelines for the carriage, for the safe carriage of calcium hypochlorite. And all arising from that particular initiative, initiative and the success of it, other guidelines have been published since on the carriage of hides, carriage of charcoal, I believe, and others as well, all which are freely available up on the international group's websites or on the, the websites of the individual uh, PNI clubs. But also this group does show as well that properly declared packed and stored calcium hypochlorite is safe to carry in containers and need not be banned. So what we're saying is that goods which are properly declared and stored in the appropriate places safely um, and uh, they, can be they can be carried safely, that's the point. So good guidance about the safe carriage of uh, dangerous goods is what SINS is about amongst other things. The uh, pie chart on the side, or at least the, the, the chart on the side, shows some of the major incidents in October where uh, inspections revealed that the major areas of concern, that was about half, but you can see that misdeclarations was discovered in 17 cases. And as I say, it just takes one misdeclaration of a cargo in the wrong place at the wrong time will cause or can cause a disaster on board. So, misdeclared cargo, how is it misdeclared? I'll just talk about a bit more about this, just to show you the dangers and the difficulties that the various stakeholders, the carriers, the insurers, port, state, customs are wrestling with these days. Well, the, the misdeclaration can occur in the following ways, and I, I mentioned earlier on with the manganese, uh, the, the lithium iron battery has been described as manganese cells. Um, the use of a synonym instead of a proper shipping name. Again, calcium hypochlorite has been bleaching powder, it's been pool wash, it's been uh, ble uh, uh, cleansing agents. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't get described as calcium hypochlorite because it knows that the, the shipper knows that it will be picked up and intercepted and uh, refused if, if it's not declared correctly. Last minute bookings is a frequent um, aspect of this. We understand commercial pressure is put on the carrier. The shipper will uh, de declare the cargo in a very much an outline and then at the last minute will hit the shipper or hit the, the carrier with a, a la last minute uh, declaration. Now puts commercial pressure on the, the carrier to, to take the, the, the cargo. Also, we know that there is multiple use of freight forwarders. In order to try and disguise the origin of the particular cargo, it will frequently be uh, directed through a number of, of uh, freight forwarders in order to try and disguise both the content and who the original shipper was. Fraudulent customs and laboratory documents, well, that goes without saying, I'm sure, as all surveyors, you have come across similar kind of incidents where, where there's been fraudulent use of documentation uh, for, to disguise the, the, the cargos. And then also an, an obvious one is the last minute change to the uh, uh, bill of lading. So there will be a misdeclaration made and then suddenly the shipper tries to make it right by making a change to the bill of lading after the cargo has been shipped on board. Now uh, that, that is a tactic that's well used as well and we're familiar with it. So those are just some of the methods that are used to get the cargo, the dangerous cargo, which is being misdeclared onto vessels. So what can be done? And should we open and survey every container? 
Should we stop charging for the, 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 the surcharge for the dangerous goods? Well, these are questions that the industry has been wrestling with for a long time. But just think of the, the practicalities here for a moment. If we're talking about a 20,000 TEU vessel, for example, for example, even if we could survey a, each container in one minute, just one minute, 20, thousand minutes is a very very long time a very long time it doesn't take a genius to work out the man hours required to to do that we're talking many days of surveying on a 24 hours a day basis so the reality is that it is probably not feasible even allowing for just one minute to check every single container shipped and that is a structural a systemic challenge that the container industry has to face Also, so now what can be done? Well, here begins the, the kind of pushback and this is where the p &I clubs and the carriers are working in conjunction with each other to try and raise awareness. So the first, the first basic requirement is that carriers should know their customers. And this is much easier said than done. It is actually quite difficult for all carriers to know all their customers, but it shouldn't reduce the effort made to try and identify who is shipping the good. It's important that the shipper doesn't hide, the fraudulent shipper doesn't hide behind simply a brass plate company set up just to ship goods. Now, when we're talking about container full, container sizes of calcium hypochlorite, we're not talking about a village workshop here. We're talking about uh, production on an industrial scale, but still we're aware of brass plate companies being formed to get shipments on board vessels. So the carriers are comparing registered addresses with lists of previously rejected company addresses. So there's due diligence being done here, um, carrying out public domain search and references, trying to get the booking clerks in the carrier's offices to diligently research as best they possibly can the source and the, the, the credentials of the shipper. Trade routes and cargoes carried. If there's suddenly a, a shipper presenting a cargo that has never appeared before, or if it's heading for an unusual destination, these kind of questions would and should raise flags for further investigation. And now we know that carriers are carrying out uh, in advanced uh, an enhanced uh, customer vetting process uh, to try and address this challenge in more detail, particularly for the freight forwarders themselves to maybe tie the freight forwarders into the carrier's operations and, and so that there's a better transparency of, of activity. But we know, we're not uh, naive about this. The, the insurers and this, the carriers recognize that there is a major challenge to make this, uh, to make these changes, uh, implement them first and make them effective second. It is difficult. Also, taking those, those points and, and then just a slight uh, further uh, description of them here, we think that the booking process has to be tightened up. This is now, Having done all the other checks, the actual booking process has to be tightened also. So software, very, very clever software is being designed and being uh, and has been in, in play now amongst the major carriers. The one that's of, of probably best known right now is Cargo Patrol. I think it was produced by Hapag Lloyd and which has been adopted by some of the other carriers in order to uh, catch the, 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 the misdeclared are undeclared DG goods uh, by, by uh, using synonyms, by detection of the, of the descriptions, anything that's suspicion, that's suspicious is investigated further. But also more practical aspects are being implemented as well, like clearly defined and enforced booking deadlines uh, for both DG and non-DG cargos for existing and for uh, new customers. In other words, that there's a, there are deadlines now introduced to reduce the kind of flexibility that aided the, the shipment uh, or the loading of uh, misdeclared cargoes. 
the HS code. This is the harmonized system for, for uh, customs use around the world. There is greater encouragement now to use this code to try and uh, identify the product uh, more specifically um, through the code, um, which, which has better use of descriptions. And again, you, know, you, you would be surprised that I mentioned this thing, but that there should be a thorough check of all documents submitted at the booking stage. Now you'd imagine that this would be normal, but the reality is it's not, that there are aspects to the booking operation that are just under too much pressure. The booking clerks don't always have the time or the skills, or the training to recognize documentation. Therefore, we uh, the best practice in the business now is that more time and more resources is given to documentation checking. Background checks on the manufacturer to ensure that they produce the cargo. In other words, that the cargo uh, shipper or the manufacturer, who may not necessarily be the same thing, that there is a thorough investigation and, and uh, know your customer, know your client, due diligence has been done on them. And that brings, brings me to the point about training, because all of those previous um, uh, initiatives all depend upon the training, not only to the DG staff, but also to non-DG and to document control. The whole system only works. It's predicated upon people who have the right training, the right knowledge, the right experience, maybe also extending to the use of uh, specialist surveyors, to assist in stopping this practice of uh, our improving safety and stopping misdeclared cargo. But we again know, we recognize that this might well be an idealistic approach. In reality, it's harder to implement. We know that, but it doesn't, it doesn't invalidate the, the efforts that should be made and must be made to try and get a better grip on this particular problem. So what can be done? We were talking about authority levels at the booking clerk's uh, office here. Um, escalation of authority level clearly defined in case mismatch is found. In other words, that the decision to go, no go, load, don't load, is not resting at the lowest level of the, the booking clerk uh, structure, that there should well be an escalation anytime a mismatch is found. That is just, in our view, prudence and common sense. And there must be uh, recognition as well that the booking office must have sufficient authority to push back when concerns are raised. In other words, that they're not overridden by other commercial uh, interests further up the chain in the hierarchy, which, which uh, overrules the booking clerk's um, concerns. Th that has to stop. And authority level also to add new customer or cargo to the software. All of these has to be carefully, carefully guarded so that there isn't a, a, any kind of uh, liberal use or interpretation or relaxation of the rules being done at a local level by an individual without it being absolutely clear to the uh, senior personnel in the operation that these relaxation uh, of the rules has, uh, has taken place. And last, and we would emphasize this point, there should not be any uh, allowance or permission to load, uh, to, to accept late declaration of uh, non-DG cargos. We, we, we can't have this going on. There has to be a, a reasonable cutoff where no further cargo is allowed on board because we we strongly suspect that this is one of the principal routes in which misdeclaration of cargo is succeeds through the late presentation or declaration of of, of uh, cargos. I just mentioned very very briefly the slot charterers. This is a very important issue with. Uh, uh, the safe carriage of goods, because a lot of the cargo, uh, uh, the big, big uh, 
uh, container lines, they share slots and board. And this is economically a very prudent thing to do, a very reasonable thing to do in order to use up capacity. So if it can't go on a merge ship, it goes on an MSC or it goes on CMA and they swap and share their, their space and board to maximize the carrying capacity of the vessel on any particular shipment. But the danger there, of course, is that what one company does well, another company may not do so well. And we are aware of situations where a shipper fails to get his non, his, his suspicious cargo onto one vessel, so then he goes to another carrier and presents it there. That carrier may not be uh, as diligent and may not detect that there is a problem with the cargo. And suddenly through the vessel sharing agreement, the cargo ends up back at the first carrier who had refused it because of concerns in relation to the description or to the nature of the cargo. So there's the danger, a, a, a good system for sharing and maximizing the economy and, and, uh, and carrying capacity vessel suddenly becomes a major weakness in detecting dangerous goods. So we are asking and we have been encouraging uh, carriers to beef up their uh, systems, but also in the sharing agreements as well. And we, we uh, just my other point, just maybe laboring this point a bit, the due diligence of the slot charter needs to be relied upon uh, completely. So, but we know that there's a problem with the, the actual disclosure of commercially sensitive information. So often the information that is shared between the charters, uh, between the, the vessel sharing agreement participants um, and the companies is often very light touch. Now, there are anti-competition, antitrust rules that have to be respected for sure and what can and cannot be shared. But unfortunately, the people who are doing this operation fraudulently in, with mis cargo misdeclaration and the fraudulent movement of dangerous goods are exploiting this vulnerability, this issue very effectively. And the rest, the accident, the fire, uh, that becomes history. You can, you can see how it, it, it causes a major problem. So we're asking and encouraging the, the major uh, carriers to know their clients very well, but also know what happens in the uh, with the other uh, participants in the vessel sharing agreements to make sure that they also are doing their part to protect everybody's interest in this uh, process. So it's going to be a very a rattled through in a very uh, relatively quick way, Mike, but I'm just going to start summarizing right now what I've just been saying. So my points have been this, a very large number of containers are misdeclared daily. We don't see any immediate uh, reduction in the in numbers of, of misdeclared, misdeclared, misdeclared cargoes and misdeclarations going on. So it remains a very real concern. Clearly, from what I've been saying, you will appreciate that the container industry has to work together to tackle this problem. No one container, given the nature of the business, no one uh, container ship operator or owner can resolve this issue on their own because the weaknesses of single, because of the vessel sharing agreement for one and, and the degree of sophistication for two is just too much for a single owner, even for the very, very biggest uh, owner operators to resolve uh, on their own. So it has to be a collective effort. And thirdly, the booking process improvements, controls and streamlining needs to be considered and adopted. From what I've been saying, you'll appreciate the concern that we have on the weaknesses that are almost systemic in those operations. Something has to be done to improve the rigor and discipline of the booking process and, and we, we know that it can be done. So where does the will? There is surely a way, you know. 
knowing your customer is absolutely key for for sure you, you do need to know who is shipping the uh the dangerous goods um you need to know if uh well you need to know all your customers but particularly the the manufacturers of dangerous goods and this this goes this extends as far as good detective work uh at the points of shipment as well so that all suspicions, if there if there are suspicions, are recognised and are investigated, uh, relating to cargo shipments. And I just mentioned the point about the vessel sharing agreement, the slot charters. Clearly, there is room for improvement in tightening up the the systems there as well, and that perhaps there would be something like a mutual audit there where uh, MERS goes to CMA or MSC goes to Hapag Lloyd and they mutually carry out their due diligence on, on those companies, even though they're competitors, but maybe just they can pool their resources on a safety front for the interests of, of improved safety on board vessels. So audits are some sort of assurance program amongst the the uh, the competitors is possible just to uh, improve the level of safety and the training i refer back to this as well uh, the the people at the sharp end of this business on the key side in the booking offices the the guys on board the vessels uh, the shippers the freight forwarders training and the uh, raising awareness of the dangers of misdeclared cargos and the mortal dangers that they present to vessels with masters uh, and, and crews on board is very real and uh, is uh, still a very major concern to all the stakeholders in the business. And I'll leave you with just a couple of slides just to illustrate the, the challenge. You will all be aware of the Maersk Honam and the terrible consequences of a, a dangerous good. Now, I'm not saying misdeclaration here because up until relatively recently, until the Singaporean authorities published a report, there was a presumption of misdeclaration, but that may not be the case. There's further investigation going on here, but for the purposes of this talk, it just illustrates the dangers of dangerous goods being in a certain place at a certain time and when it goes wrong it can go very spectacularly wrong um, there's the vessel on fire disabled indian ocean and those are two pictures that the masters on the and the crew members on the bridge before they abandoned ship but those would have been the last views that would have been on fire in a spectacular way as the crew members try to evacuate the vessel. Um, if you read the report, uh, you will read in detail of what happened subsequently in the uh, attempts to get off the vessel. Lives were lost. Uh, five people succumbed to their injuries and, and, uh, and died. And it remains a very visible reminder to all concerned that this is a deadly serious business and it must it must be tackled to reduce the risks to the crews on board the vessel primarily and to all of the cargo and stakeholders in the business so if you want to know more about the questions that i've uh, uh, try to answer in this particular presentation you could do yourself a favor by visiting our website illustrated there it's on the standard clubs website but the book the or the publication that's there that can be downloaded for free was uh, put together by my colleague e vandenborn and uh, it's called standard safety better box booking it is a a fantastic resource for getting a greater understanding of what happens in the box business, how things are, are uh, uh, booked on board the vessels, how they are carried, what checks are made, etc., with various recommendations that I've summarized rather quickly in this presentation. A very, very well worthwhile exercise to download that if this is an area of particular interest to you. And on that, basis 
I will complete Mike and I will say thank you very much indeed to all for, for listening to me today. Thank you and I hope it's been of interest. John, thank you very much indeed. Um, we've discovered, a, we've covered off a fair share of rather distressing topics today already, the death in enclosed spaces and all of those things. Um, and I just think yet again, this is another example, I agree entirely with you, it absolutely must be tackled. I've got a question for you on the chat. Uh, which is from Ed, who asks, is there a movement by carriers to fine backcharge shippers that are found to often misdeclare DG cargo? And what is the scope of such charges? The answer, I, I, I will first of all put my hand up here and say I'm not the expert in this area in terms of the charging, so I'm going to caveat my reply here heavily. But I am aware of initiatives by some carriers to impose a surcharge or a fine. Now, the reality is that imposing such a fine um, is one thing, enforcing such a fine as indeed collecting it is quite another thing. So it may well be more, uh, I, I'd hate to say PR, but it, it could well be a, a, a difficult uh, initiative to enforce. Um, the levels of fine, I, I heard various amounts mentioned, five to $10,000. I'm not absolutely certain of that right now. And I know it was launched to some uh, kind of fanfare about 18 months ago, I think it was now, but I haven't heard anything since or anything meaningful since. So I'm not so sure that it's been as successful as might have been imagined. And don't forget as well that an inhibitor to such charges would be simply the nature, the brutally competitive nature of the box trades, where if there's a, a slight movement of, of uh, pricing pressure on one side, the, the cargo shifts to another carrier. So it is a very, very price sensitive business. So surcharges, fines, call you what you like. Um, might be a good idea, but enforcing them might be a challenge. Uh, yes, sadly, I agree with you, John. Um, the other point I had is you, you talked about pushing this right up the food chain, as it were, if that's the right uh, phrase, to the people you know at the top of this um, scheme, who feel or, or scam or whatever you want to call it, or both <laughs> criminal act. Um, can you almost sort of get see a time where the, you might be sort of appealing to them that this is a moral dilemma? You know, I mean, are they aware of what they are doing? Are they aware of the potential of their actions and, and try and play on the moral side? I mean, am I too innocent and simplistic? I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't want to, to confirm your worst suspicions about your, about your the, the, the simplicity there, Mike. I'm, I'm far too, far too kind for that. I, I would say, I would say that this is, um, uh, I mean, the, the incentive to avoid a thousand dollars or fourteen hundred dollars surcharge on a box because it's DG. Um, if people will will put at, lives at risk to save that kind of money, uh, I, I know I appreciate it. it is per box. So if you're, if you're shipping a awful lot of boxes, then it adds up for sure. But the dangers associated with misdeclaration are so great that yes, there should be a moral imperative here to encourage people. Sadly, Mike, yeah. it doesn't work. It, I, I honestly don't think so. What, what would make a difference and what is taking place now is that the uh, Chinese authorities for which much of this, much of this cargo, uh, in, in, at least in the past, originated in China, they have begun to turn the, turn the screws on shippers partly and primarily, I would imagine, because of the Tianjin disaster, to try and uh, tighten up the processes here as, as well. But there's so much more to go. And there's other areas. I know uh, Indonesia has been another area where, where cargo has em emerged from, charcoal shippers particularly, who tried to miss the clear as well. Yeah, priming stuff. Any more questions for John before we let him go? No, I think you've done a good job. <laughs> uh, you touched on the uh, Merce Conum. Um, that report is freely downloadable from the IMS website if anybody wants to pick that one up and read it. It was released quite recently, John, wasn't it? Only a couple of months ago. 
it, well, even less than that, I think the Singaporeans released it about a month, last month, I think it was, and maybe, yeah. maybe uh, you, you could be right, actually, I'm not entirely sure, it might be the beginning of October, end of October, beginning yeah, of November, but, oh. but it, should be, it should be required reading, though, for anybody involved in, in the safety of shipping, and I would include all of your, your members on that, the surveyors, I mean, your primary job is to, you know, provide assurance to what, to whatever act, actually they do, but fundamentally there's a safety dimension to it. And uh, the Maersk Honam uh, investigation published by the, the uh, report published by the Singaporean authorities should really be required reading. And, and it's a note to self because I'm about halfway through it already, but I, I need to, to finish it off. But there's some really good insights there, particularly in the description of what actually happens on board the vessel in when the uh, incident happened and, and the, the sheer terror that the guys on board were subject to in trying to get off that vessel um, is, is most interesting for, for certainly for anybody who's been at sea and who's actually knows what it's like to be on a ship in, 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 uh, in, in troubled times. And of course, worryingly, you then worry and have concern for their future mental well-being, don't you, having gone through a... Uh, oh. Most certainly, most certainly. When you when you read the article and particularly around the, the the actions taken by the crew, from the detection to eventual uh, evacuation and, or abandoning of the vessel, I mean it is hair raising stuff. It it, it reads like a, like a, almost like a thriller. So it, it it is worth reading because of the takeaway. There shows all aspects of the dangers of what's involved plus the importance of emergency procedures and good training. It brings it all into play there in that one, two, three hour period from detection to uh, abandonment. Yeah, no, absolutely. I do have one more question for you that Peter's popped up. Uh, with growing global trade via the internet, um, how do we deal with LCL, LCL cargoes and customers? Oh, okay. That's 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 a good question. I'm I'm off my comfort zone here now. Um, internet booking, of course, it, it, it's a double-edged sword from particularly from we'll say an insurance perspective because, for sure, the the upside to the to the carrier is the efficiency of the booking. You know, it's it's captured there one point one entry, often self-declared, and suddenly it generates all of the processes and documentation necessary for the shipment, and it's all done in in uh, a few moments. Of course, that that comes at the cost of due diligence. Can it can be, and so so now uh, that that opens up all sorts of challenges to you know, for the LCLs and 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 those people. So. Um, I, I really don't know the answer to the question, other than to say that it probably increases the challenges associated with knowing what happens and what's been carried um, in, in containers at any particular time. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. John, thank you very much indeed. And uh, many thanks to the Standard Club for helping us today. Much appreciated. Um, hope to see you again in the not too distant future. <laughs> Well, Michael, thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you to all. I hope all your, your members are keeping safe in this crazy, crazy time. Uh, well, it, it, is, it is an odd environment for sure, and uh, I don't know where the vaccine is, is now. It's coming into the UK next week, I'm told. We've got the first doses coming in, and that might help to look like a shape we you know for a better 2021. So uh, stay safe, John, and uh, look after yourself. Good. Well, thank you again, Mike. All the very best to you, and good luck. Bye-bye. I could ask you just to share your, uh, to stop your share.